What's going on, everybody? I am Perry White. I'm the host of the Jaguar Journal. I want to make sure that you guys tune in live each and every Saturday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 107.3 FM. We also have our affiliates in Alexandria, Louisiana, as well as down in New Orleans. And if you're not able to catch us on Radio Live, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow us on Facebook. It's the Jaguar Journal. Spoken, informative, the Jaguar Journal. Your source for the latest information on Southern University sports and SWAC athletics. A Baton Rouge sports talk tradition. Right, we are live. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is the Jaguar Journal. I am Perry White, and this is Mrs. Brandy B. Harris. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And we are live this morning. Hope you guys had a great week. How was your week, Miss Harris? It was. It's Mrs. Been a, Harris, it's I got to get long, that right. It's been a long week. I think we're all looking forward to a little break when it comes to Easter weekend and festivities and all that good stuff. Now, we were talking off air before we got started this morning. You know, you got to get the blood flowing early this morning. And crawfish. I know a lot of people out there have been talking. He got hot takes. I'm not. I'm going to let him go ahead and, and shame himself hey, on the is, airwaves to it, everybody. Look, I walk around and I'm okay with this, okay? <laughs> but, you know, crawfish were, I don't know what the prices is look, are looking like now, but the prices were high here in, in Louisiana. And I know the the crawfish uh, producer were kind of dealing with some things, but you said things are leveling out now, huh? Well, yeah, the prices are the the crawfish watchers. Those of us on the crawfish watch, okay, we have been watching the prices, so we know that the prices have dropped quite considerably. Now, if you one of them old heads, one of them OGs, that's like crawfish in my day used to be a dollar ninety nine. Oh we may God. we may never get back to those days. Oh my God! But they have leveled down, and and it looks like um, the farmers that. Small Business Administration has approved their request for some disaster relief from the drought. So I wouldn't be surprised if the prices keep going down for this Easter weekend coming up and for Mother's Day, you know, coming up later in the spring. Big news in Louisiana. You know, you, you, you start, when, when you start the show, you have to give the people what they need to hear about crawfish because people out there. People, listen up. Go get them crawfish for Good Friday and Easter weekend. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's, and let me know. Send me an invitation because I am fiending. Itching to have my first sack of crawfish. See, we were talking about this in like in Louisiana, right down in this area, a, a date, right? If I meet a chick, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, whatever, whatever. After the texting and the talking, let's go grab Shout some crawfish. Shout out to my husband. Shout out to my husband, Aris Harris. That's what we would do when we were in college. Instead of going out to eat and getting an appetizer, snowballs, three to five pounds of crawfish, eat that, enjoy that, then go out to eat. 
A Louisiana love story. Perry said that. Uh, also. I love that. That is accurate. A Louisiana love story. It's a way to a woman's heart in South Louisiana. I'm, I see. And I've noticed that since I've been here. Uh, if when you I've, really want to woo a woman in mm -hmm. Louisiana, show up with that. So show up with them crawfish. So when I first moved here for school, the chick I was dating at the time, I guess she was going to woo me or she was trying to teach me how to woo her. Right. 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 And at that time, there was a spot off a of scenic highway. We would go get crawfish. And it was always like get crawfish, daiquiri, right. or uh, she like Delaware punch. You ever okay, had? Okay, yes, yes, yeah. yes. And that with the super cool old school. You aging yourself this morning. It is. It's okay. <laughs> it is okay, right? But then you know you go to the park and uh, we got all this crawfish, corn, and the potatoes. I'm not the biggest fan of the potatoes, and I'm not look, super hot takes. Yeah, Continue. come on. <laughs> and so the first time I had the crawfish. I didn't realize really what I was getting myself into. So I'm trying to eat it, and I'm standing, you know, I'm... Oh, yeah. no! So I'm trying, and guess what? I had on a white polo shirt. I must have cracked it the wrong way. And oh, it's, juice. It, it's you already me. know. I well, you it. wore a white polo shirt. I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And that stain don't come out. I know it don't. That's well, see, we are. it was always stuff like this. Pattern stuff, so a little juice on that. No I wear problem. an apron now, you know. No. <laughs> get a little bib. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I need an apron when I'm Ain't I nothing wrong with that. I, I like to make sure that all of my clothes are covered up when I'm eating crawfish. Yeah, I'm one a... of those people. The older I get, honey, I pay for the nails. I'm going to wear gloves at my house. Oh my now, when God. I go to other people's houses, I don't do that because I know how South Louisiana do. Y'all be judging and stuff. I get manicures, okay? So I'm going to take care of my little nails. But I'm the last man standing at the table. And I just woman think standing at the table. One of the most disgusting things to me, and I don't care, y'all can judge, because y'all gonna do it anyway. You've been doing it for hundreds of years in Louisiana, getting that juice out the the head or the body. This of it. man I just think is not having a real appreciation for the culture that we provide to the world. I eat it gumbo. Is deliciousness. I eat it is deliciousness. I eat red beans and rice. It is deliciousness. But when I see that if you grew up eating hog head cheese, I don't want to hear you talking about the heads of the crawfish, period. I didn't grow up eating hog hair. A lot cheese. of people did. Okay, well, don't you say that. The, Them country people out here certainly do. I just started liking boiled okra. How about that? Okay. With some cornbread. Okay. Right. You eat boiled okra? Well, no, I eat okra with, like, sausage and shrimp. Yeah, that, what's that, like, succotash or whatever they call it? I don't know what it, they like, call it. It's called... It got a name anywhere. You go, it's just different. Yeah, call me, fill me up. Yeah, that crawfish. Look, you give me some shrimp. This is my favorite time of the year in Louisiana. It truly is because it's that stretch before it gets to be triple digit heat. You uh, know what I'm saying? Where we are like sunny and 70 and it's yeah. like, is it San Diego out here? Like it's so beautiful and we all just are so kind and there's so many events and you can enjoy things. You know what I mean? We're going to get to that point where it's in the spring, you know, it's going to be an afternoon thunderstorm every day between about two and six. It's going to rain. Right. Just a random pop up shower. And I love it up until the humidity. I'm okay with that's the what, That's digit. what I'm saying. Yeah, that it's, that, it's that late May, once that June creep in, that we all just... You got to take two, three showers a day, Because man. it is hot. It is humid. It is don't mess with me out here. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know like, it's hot when you sweat behind your kneecap. Listen, you ain't even did listen, nothing. Listen, it's just wet. No, like, what's listen, my kneecap behind listen. my knees wet? When it's, it's when you get in the car every day and you're like, I hope I didn't leave something in here that melted because oh. it is so hot. So I'm look. I'm appreciative of the time right now. They say yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift, and that's why we call it the present. So I'm enjoying this spring weather, this March 70 degrees and sunny. Even if we get some showers, I'm not gonna complain. I'm trying to be appreciative of the current moment. We got a lot going on in Jaguar <laughs> land too. It is a lot going on. Southern University just naming a new chancellor of the Southern University Baton Rouge campus. Yes, uh, John Pierre, who of course. Uh, ran the law center for a long time, and a lot of people love him. A lot of people have admiration for him. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about that here after we take a break. But just the idea now that Southern at one time had its own chancellor for the Baton Rouge mm -hmm. campus, and then they combined it and made it a dual role for the president over the system and the chancellor over the campus. And I think as time goes on, uh, the SUBR campus needs a lot more attention to detail to someone paying attention to the campus within itself 
more so the campus and then the entire system. If you're listening out there, of course, Southern is the only HBCU system in the world with campuses in Shreveport, New Orleans. You also have the Law Center, the Ag Extension, and the Baton Rouge campus itself. So that is a lot to take a, take in for anybody. Each one of the campuses have their own things to deal with, and each one of those campuses have administrators in place. So when you have the, the head guy, of course, Dr. Dennis Shields, we've had him here on the show and hopefully get him here back on the show soon. Uh, that can be a lot because each one of those campuses need attention to detail. They all need their own fundraising purposes and so much more. So for Southern University, Baton Rouge, and trust me, Chancellor Pierre knows that campus well. Mm -hmm. He knows the students. He recruits well when you're talking about getting undergrad students and recruiting them over to the well, law finally, center. Finally being able to split that position, that president and chancellor position, so that the president can do the part that he really is instilled, installed in to do, which mm -hmm. is oversee the entire system. Each system brings its own component to the larger, painting the larger picture. Mm -hmm. That is the Southern University system. So it's great that Mr. Shields, with all of, Dr. Shields, excuse me, with all Some of his experience, with all of his knowledge in um, educational administration and academics, that's going to make such a difference for what he can bring to the system and yep. being able to focus his attention on connecting the system to other university systems out there and to not just to other HBCUs, but to other academic institutions all over the world. Now he can focus on that and not just have to zoom in on Southern University and Baton Rouge. About Chancellor Pierre, I mean, I could go on and on and on. What the man has done for the Law Center, what he does for the Southern University culture, like on campus representing mm -hmm. Southern University out here in the world, especially in the legal profession, is just such a huge thing. So. I cannot wait to hear from him to see what his plan is going to be, especially for that very first year mm -hmm. of, you know, um, overseeing the land grant campus. So I'm very, very excited to see what we what happens for Southern University A&M College in Baton Rouge. I mean, we, I, we, you were talking to the Ag Center. I've talked to the Ag Center. They just had their livestock show. They're one of the last HBCUs that's still doing one of those full Ag livestock shows. Mm -hmm. So. For him to be able to focus on that and have an administrator that's just focusing, focusing on the land grant, grant campus is going to be fantastic. So many changes are already coming for Southern, um, you know, in the coming years anyway. So many different plans. I know there's a lot of different um, maintenance and stuff that's coming up. So I'm very excited to see what Mr. Pierre does. Oh, well, I'm excited right here to take a break because we got to pay some bills and stay tuned. We'll be back. More of the Jaguar Journal. Danny Johnson, uh, first and foremost, Outstanding young man, great character, um, great young man. I uh, can't say enough about him. Uh, great father. You always see him, you know, hanging around with his son and spending time with his son and his family. Um, as a player, uh, I can't say enough about him. He has all the athletic ability that you want in a, in a kid with playing corner, uh, the footwork, speed, um, all the intangibles. You know, I have a good work ethic. You know, it's been a lot of times, you know, in the off season, I got to just push myself to go work out. You know, even if nobody else was out there, just to, you know, get an extra push when we get back into the season, you know, because I, want, I always want to have that edge over everybody else. So, you know, it's just that mindset that I have. You know, I want to I want to be one of the best. So, you know, I got to push myself, you know, if anybody else does. And it's like a lot of stuff that I want to do with my son that I can't do because I'm, I'm playing ball. So my biggest return to him is just, you know, having him come to games on Saturday, and, you know, he can see his father play in front of you know, thousands of people. You know, it's just, it makes him happy. So whenever he's happy, I'm happy. But just when I get the chance to just go home and, you know, hear everything, you know, he's been doing in school and, you know, what he what he likes and doesn't like, you know, it just brings me back to that, just that fatherhood of just being around him. And that's what I like to do. You know, I put academics over football because, you know, I can't play football forever. You know, at some point, you know, I'm going to have to rely on that degree. So, you know, that's my biggest thing. And that's one reason why I came to Southern to get that degree. So I set myself up to where I'll be able to graduate right after the season. So if football doesn't work out for me, I can always come back and go to grad school. So, you know, education is a big thing for me. Danny Johnson put Southern University on a you know national stage. Obviously, everybody knows about Jag Nation and Southern University, but uh, you'll see Danny Johnson playing on Sunday one day, and he'll be able to be an, amb an ambassador, you know, for the university.
What's going on, everybody? I am Perry White. I'm the host of the Jaguar Journal. I want to make sure that you guys tune in live each and every Saturday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 107.3 FM. We also have our affiliates in Alexandria, Louisiana, as well as down in New Orleans. And if you're not able to catch us on Radio Live, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow us on Facebook. It's the Jaguar Journal. All right, we are back. It is the Jaguar Journal. I am Perry White, joined here to this morning with Mrs. Brandy B. Harris. We rocking morning, and rolling. Good morning. good morning, good morning. Come on now. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. The big news this morning. We, it, I mean, it really is big news this morning. It is. The big news this morning. You want to say it or you want me to say it? Ladies. Okay. Right, Southern ladies. University and A&M College has named Chancellor John K. Pierre as the now Chancellor of Southern University. Um, in Baton Rouge, and it's a pretty big deal. He's going to be moving from being the chancellor of the Southern University Law Center to now overseeing the entire Baton Rouge campus, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. You kind of gave us the headline earlier of that means that now, after some years, separating the president-chancellor role from overseeing the entire system and the university to President Shields will now be able to focus on being the president of the entire system mm -hmm. and Chancellor Pierre will be in charge of the Baton Rouge campus. That's it. I haven't heard a lot. Of, I haven't seen a lot of um, reaction from folks because I was so busy just trying to see what the university said. Mm -hmm. And they did put out um, a press release. So of John K. Pierre, um, he says, as a higher education advocate, I am high honored that the Southern University System Board of Supervisors and Search Committee are competent in my ability to champion and lead the Southern University and A&M University College. Um, he says he's committed to advancing the university's mission and fostering partnerships that will position students, faculty, staff, and administrators and alumni to serve as transformational change agents, which is kind of a, very similar to the role that he's already been playing as the chancellor of the law center. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Shields uh, saying that he and Chancellor Pierre have worked closely together in the last six months, even before this board vote. So when Chancellor Pierre appeared as one of the finalists, I don't know about you, but I really wasn't surprised. No, not at all. Because of the what, what he's done for the Law Center, the way he's represented the entire Southern University system through being Chancellor of the Law Center. Mm -hmm. um, you know, transformational change. So what we know about him, okay, since 1990, he's been serving in a faculty and administrative role at the Law Center. In 2016, he became the Chancellor of the Law Center, um, making it, again, a global institution. I don't know if people know, but... The Southern University Law Center is unique in that it provides part-time classes, night classes. Most law schools, you've got to go to school full-time. And we know that in many communities, you can't go to school and not be able to provide for yourself. That's so it. the fact that the Southern University Law Center has continued in that mission of making um, law education available and open as an opportunity to everybody, such is such a huge deal. In 2023, the Southern University Board of Supervisors, System Board of Supervisors, Tap Pierre to serve as the interim executive vice president of the Baton Rouge campus. So again, he's kind of already been slowly stepping into a major administrative role before joining academia. Here is him before all this time from 86 to 1990. He served as a judge, judge advocates, general corps officer. I'm sorry, JAG officer for the United States Army. So obviously he's been involved in law. Um, he was also involved in the Baton Rouge school desegregation case as co-counsel of the Baton Rouge branch of the NAACP and Davis versus East Baton Rouge Parish School Board. Um, so he served in some pretty landmark cases, including Mc, McWaters versus FEMA. In addition to that, he's won some pretty top awards. Educator of the Year from the Thurgood Marshall College Fund and top 10 most dominant HBCU leaders from the HBCU Campaign Fund. Um, so many different organizations he's a part of. Of course, from his alma mater, Southern Methodist University and Dedman School of Law, he's named as a distinguished alumni. So he's really been pr 
proven his weight for many, many, many years here. SMU. Yeah, so he's he's got a lot going on there. Um, even got a master's degree in tax accounting. Oh, I did not know that from Texas Tech University in 1982. And of course, he graduated from law school from Southern Methodist University School of Law in 1985. So he's been a part of some very important academic situations and very excited to see what he does as he steps into that major leadership role for the land grant campus. Congratulations to Chancellor John Pierre being able to take over the campus. Much needed attention to detail for the Baton Rouge campus, of course. Uh, everybody have their ups and downs, and we get it here on the show. I get it a lot of times when I'm talking to people out, you know, uh, criticism, right? Mm -hmm. And criticism comes in so many different forms. A lot of times it's just people running their mouth, talking noise, not trying to be involved. But I think when you have a guy that's very personable like Chancellor Pierre, he's a guy that's not afraid or does not feel higher than when it comes to having conversations with students, faculty, mm -hmm. and alums. And he's a very uh, social person. He's not anti-social. You know, a lot of times you have when people get into administrative roles, they kind of take a step back. And actually, I think you should take five steps forward when you talk about being social with people, getting out, getting to understand the community around the school that supports it, getting out here talking to the younger generation right. that are ultimately can be, that's going to be your customer, the customer, which is the student, you know, that relationship to the community and within the people that are all in tied to it, just like here at the Jaguar journal, it matters because I'm a Southern graduate. You a Southern graduate. We all know we love our institution. And many of, the, of you who wake up bright and early, you got to love Southern to wake up bright and early to be wondering about what's going on at Southern and then to go back and listen. And because of that, we thank y'all for that. So make sure you go hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook at the Jaguar Journal. That way you can continue to get this information. Yes. But it matters when you have a guy like John Pierre uh, who is about the people. And most of all, he's about the growth of the institution. And just to piggyback on what you're saying there, you know, Southern University and, and like, like many HBCUs across the country has served as a a community hub That's in it. its location, not just here, but in all of the different um, parts of the system. But here, I think Chancellor Pierre has always understood that, so he's taken advantage of that to make the law center more accessible. They have so many different expungement programs and, and law representation programs for the community. So to have him continue to be a part of this community as he moves on in his academic career, I think should be a good thing for the university. I look forward to seeing what happens by having um, that president chancellor position now split and seeing how much more they can do for the university and for the system mm -hmm. by being able to focus in on, you know, both the, the big umbrella tent and the, the parts in between. it. And what's so interesting, you talk about the community and it's just not the black community. If you look at Southern law and you ever just took a day to yes. walk through the halls and the classrooms, you would see both white, black, and everything else within that. Former governors of Louisiana went to the Southern University Law Center. That's it. I mean, we could do this all day long. That's why it is a, and a standout, it's a global institution as far mm -hmm. as um, American law goes because of the fact that it offers, like I said earlier, those night classes, mm -hmm. part-time classes. That mean anybody, if you got a family, if you started in this thing late, the current governor of Louisiana didn't go to law school until after he was married. So the idea that people are doing that and the mm -hmm. Southern University Law Center is open for people that need that, that makes such a huge difference. And again, like we were saying, community, it makes them such a huge part of the community. Because you got to be able to go out and make some money. Because, you know, these days the women don't want to go to Applebee's. They're not trying to go to Cheesecake Fact. They don't want to go to no Chili's. There ain't no two fucking dime. They don't want that. Where y'all, where you want to go eat? Where you, where you eat? Oh, oh, I'm not like the girl. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You can't just say, I'm going to law school now, baby. Where we going to go eat? Because I'm not trying to go eat no Applebee's and no McDonald's and none of that stuff. So, yeah, so because Southern Law offers that is a, a great opportunity for people to be able to put, continue to pursue uh, an opportunity or a career in law. And now to have him over at the SUBR campus, I think is big. So now what's going to happen, you're going to have the search now for the law school uh, chancellor, which I believe is going to be huge. That's big shoes to fill, right? Freddie Pitcher, who was the uh, chancellor over the law school before uh First Chancellor black city Pierre. judge in Baton Rouge. First what now? First black city judge in Baton Rouge. First Say a little elected, louder. First elected, first elected judge in the city of Baton Rouge. That's big time. Yeah. And I have a book. <laughs> Y'all should buy his book. Should buy his book and be able to, to have that. So now being able to transition the future, what the law center is going to look like. So all of these has transpired. The board yesterday just approved Chancellor Pierre. He was a finalist, one of three. And he is ultimately now assume the role and i'm curious and interested to see what his vision is going to look like for the institution moving forward 
uh, a layout plan. Mm -hmm. I'm always big on five to 10 year plans because I think they are attainable. You and I talked about having something to look forward to. I think Southern in a unique position that it is has a lot to work and build towards. Of course, uh, last year they unveiled this six, seven hundred million dollar renovation plan to go through the campus and and new buildings and and reconstruct things. So to be able to have a guy in place to be able to lead that, but also have a vision. Uh, Tell you something, uh, Coach Dawson Odoms and I used to have conversations. And of course, he graduated from North Carolina Central. And he would tell me during that time in North Carolina Central that each president that came along through that school, ultimately what built North Carolina Central, consider what it is today as an HBCU and a really good institution in North Carolina. Each president came through and focused on something without being messed with. One president came through and focused. It was the world of academia, getting more research dollars. There was another president came in and said about campus beautification, curb appeal. Let's just make sure we make the place look like it is home and you remember home when you graduate because it's certain things where, where, like you say, you and your husband, we used to eat crawfish over here by Lake Kearney type mm-hmm. things, you know, and just continue to grow. Then you have another president maybe came in and said, well, we need to focus on athletics. So now my my focus is going to be with the AD and athletics because that is the front door uh, to any institution. So I'm curious to see what's going to be his realm of what he's going to. Is it going to entail all of those? Is it going to entail something specific? And what he wants to see uh, from the institution as it continues to move forward into the future. And it's going to be here. It was here before us. It's going to be here long after us. All right. Let's get ready to take a break. On the other side, we're going to talk some Jackson State women's basketball. Of course, they're playing in the NCAA tournament today against UConn. It's going to be a big game. And some people believe that Jackson State has a chance. Of course, winners of the sweat. Can can we say... Just got to give a shout out. And as as hard as it is, it's like eating broccoli at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. But... Congratulations to the Gremlin State Tigers for representing for HBCUs in the in the tournament. They got a call from Vice President Kamala Harris for mm-hmm. like giving them a congratulations on their appearance. Nobody expected them to win that first game in the first round, so I'm very excited to see that they did that. It put on for everybody. Everybody was so excited about it. That's it, and we're going to have Travy and Scott, of course, come on at 8 o'clock and talk to us about Gremlin State, that win, what it means for the conference, and what most importantly it means for the viewership, the people, the money That's right. for Gremlin State University. So y'all stay tuned. We'll be back. More to the Jaguar Journal. It's on the yard sports, and I'm Perry White, and what I need for you to do is go follow and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter right now. Talk about offense, we talk about Southern, and it begins with their passing game. Tom, beyond potent, we're talking about high octane, we're talking about fast break, we're talking about 41 points a game, some 500 plus yards since Terrence Levy has taken Uh, over this offense. Because that young man doesn't drop any ball. With the legacy that you started here, you gotta feel happy to see it continue on with Doug Williams. Ball now back at the 22 yard line. Levy. No pressure at all. Touchdown, Ingram. The Bayou Classic. Levy on a first and goal play. Throws a touchdown. Grambling comes with a blitz. Levy steps in the pocket. And his pass is caught. One-handed grab. Sort of in the middle of the road of the slack, but immediately they jump on the Jackson State defense. And here's Levy rolling out. And the pass is caught. Ball is at the 31-yard line. Again, throwing the football downfield. Oh, and his receiver, Hayes, makes the catch. See you later. Touchdown, Southern. If you're going to get I got some free tickets. Look out for it, brother. Going downfield. Oh, and what a play by Southern. Score. He's played a lot tougher ever since. And this is a free play for Southern. Second and 15. It's a free play. EV completes his it's pass. It's a free play. Oh, and he's still up. It's a free play. Hayes. Hayes is going to continue running inside the 10, the 5. Unbelievable Michael Hayes. Third down. And 23 for a first. Levy over the middle. Nice pass that time. Second and 20. Levy doesn't have to get it all, but he's going to have to pick up some yards. Here he is throwing, nice catch made. The receiver, Michael Hayes, there he goes. Hayes makes the catch. Hayes still on his feet. Hayes looking for blocking. Hayes trying to find a hole. Hayes is still on his feet. He alley oops. He's inside the 15 and drawn out of bounds. Touchdown. 
down. Empty backfield. Plenty of time for Levy across the middle. Has his man at the 15. You know, I don't know if you want to break the spirit of Terrence Levy or not. Here he wings one wide open down the middle and a one-handed grab made. In the way. Third down in four. And here's Lewis. Off the catch. Lewis still on his feet. And Lewis is streaking down the sideline. Touchdown. So they move back five yards. Levy on third down. Look at that. guys stepping away all right we are back good morning to everybody i am perry white miss brandy b harris in the studio with me this morning it is the jaguar journal hope you guys are having a good morning a hey, very special guest this morning because it is march madness we're talking about the ncaa tournament and let's take a look on the women's side jackson state winners of the swag now have advanced to the ncaa tournament and guess what they didn't have to deal with the 16 seed or the play-in they got a really good seed, and we got someone here to talk about. It. It's not his first time on the show, but I love any time I get a chance to have conversations with him because if you ever pay attention and listen to Jackson State sports, you hear this voice. Good morning to <laughs> Mr. Rob J. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Perry. How you doing? Doing good, man. How about yourself? I'm okay. I'm okay. You out traveling? You with the team? You over in Connecticut this morning? Right. We are in Connecticut. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're about to head to the arena in about 30 minutes uh, to get ready for the game today. All right, let's talk about the SWAC tournament. Of course, I call him Big Bad Jackson State coach Tamika Reed. Jackson State coming into today's game right in a 21-game win streak. You have had the privilege to watch this over the past five years of this dynasty, so to say, of what they have called Jackson State women's basketball. The phenomenal job what Coach Tamika Reed has been able to do. She's won three of the last four SWAC women's basketball tournament championships. Of course, Southern did knock you guys out last year. I just want to make sure <laughs> I throw that yeah, in there a little, a little bit. Take a little know, quick jab. Kind of <laughs> threw a little wrench in it. But this year, got it done, completely go through the SWAC win the tournament, and now head it into uh, the NCAA tournament. For you, just this ride watching Coach Tamika Reed and this program continue to build where they are today. Yeah, you know, she she credits uh, the loss to Southern last year on this run that they have gone through. And I, had, I have not had a chance to talk to Coach Reed or any of the players because the Jackson State media department has been so busy accommodating UConn that I can't even get an interview <laughs> with Coach Reed. So that's another story. That's another story. But uh, I just want to throw that out there. They've been so busy accommodating UConn that I can't get an interview with my own coach. Hold but on, well, talk to me about that, Rob, because now, because these are parts of the story that a lot of people don't get to hear behind the scenes when you're talking about this big stage of dealing with college basketball in the media. Absolutely, man. I mean, come on, man. Here I am traveling with the Jackson State women's basketball team. But you, my own media crew, so busy <laughs> making sure UConn get interviews with Coach Reed and the players, and here I am. I'm missing out on the interviews myself. But <laughs> I'm angry about that, so I won't. I, I won't harp on that, but I, I will. But anyway, <laughs> but Coach Reed, after the win, after they beat Alcorn in the SWAC tournament finals, she said that um, you know in that post game interview, she said that uh, they were so focused after losing to Southern last year that she recruited better and she recruited for uh this moment and that's why they were able to run through the swack like they did this year yeah you're talking about out of conference victory one over southeastern southeastern out of the southland finished with a pretty uh good record and you guys have already gotten a victory over a big east team in st john and non-conference so you've already faced a team coming out of uconn's conference as well as getting the victory over them and that mattered when you started to look at look at the seating going into the tournament and not getting that 16 seed nor that play-in game. Yeah, and then, you know, you had a lot of uh, JSU people upset about the 14 seed, saying they should have had a better seed. But you have, they have to realize that Jackson State also lost. They were blown out by two teams that's in the NCAA tournament this year. That's uh, Kansas State and Texas. So, the you know, the NCAA committee, they takes all that into consideration. And they, they don't. They look down on the swag anyway. Look what they did to Grambling. Uh, I mean, you had this guy, Joe Lenardi, saying, oh, Grambling should be happy. They should be – this is their championship being in the tournament. Man, get out of here with that. Yeah. If you win your – I feel if you win your conference championship, you don't get a play-in. You don't get a 16 seed. You should get. You should start out at a 12 seed if you win your conference championship. Look at Mississippi State. 
they give them a number eight seed. They didn't win a championship. They, didn't win. they got an at large, but you at large, you get the 16 seed. You get to play in. Come on, man. You they didn't do Grambling, right? Not at all. And I feel you and understand what you're saying. Let's look at today's matchup, UConn. You look at Geno. UConn just won that 22nd Big East uh, conference title this year. Uh, two teams in, in UConn, of course, when you say dynasty, when you're talking about Geno, you circle and you say, man, this is a program. It is not the program of yesteryears, but nonetheless, they went through Big East undefeated and won the conference. What do you see with this matchup with Jackson State that a lot of people feel has an opportunity today to be able to create some March Madness against UConn? Well, Jackson State comes in as a 30-point underdog. But like you said, uh, UConn has eight players that they will be playing. They have one, two, three, four, four players out because of injury. But the ones that's playing, they are still really, really good players. So it's still going to be really, really rough on Jackson State. If Jackson State plays well, play great defense, it may be close because, you know, when you look at uh, some of the stats, UConn, Great defensive team, great scoring team. They score over 70 points a game. As a matter of fact, they score 80 points a game. Jackson State scores 71. UConn gives up 56 points a game. JSU gives up 56. But it's, 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 it may be competitive, but I, I don't think JSU will lose by 30 points. I, I, don't, I don't think that. Well, Rob, Brandy B. Harris here. We never got a chance to meet. So good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I just want to ask you this. What is going to be Coach Reed's message to the women's team this morning? Obviously, for some of them, this is going to be their first time on a stage this large with this many eyes on it. So what do you think is going to be her message to them as they even just go into the arena today, like you said, y'all are about to do in just a bit here? I really wish I knew what her message would be. <laughs> I would know if our media team would grant me the access to Coach Reed like they did UConn. I really wish I, I knew, but we're going to get on the bus. I don't know, and, and I travel with the men throughout the year uh, with Jackson State, so this is my first time on the bus with the women's team this year. I don't know if she made a, a, a speech to them on the bus before the game. I did travel with them a couple of years ago, and she did, so I'm really not sure what her message will be, uh, but I did when we were coming here, when we uh, met at the airport to get on the charter flight, she did say, that um, she wants them to be focused, and uh, they are confident going into the game. But like I said, I don't know what she—I don't know what her message is because our Rudy Poo media department keep accommodating UConn. Okay, well let me let me rephrase the question. <laughs> what would you say to Jackson State fans that are going to be watching this game? What would you tell them to be watching for? What would be your message to the fans as they're watching the game? Well, I would say uh, you know keep your eye on Maya Crump. Mike Crump is uh, one of the best players in, in the SWAC, and uh, she's the transfer from the University of Houston. Also, keep your eye on Angel Jackson, who was a defensive, was or is a defensive uh, SWAC player of the year. She's great at blocking shots. As a matter of fact, Jackson State blocks more shots than UConn coming into this game. JSU averages five blocks a game, UConn with three. So if those two can get off to a really good start, if um, uh, Kishana Luckett can up, get off to a good start, I think Jackson State will have a chance. You know, a couple of years ago, they did have a chance and uh, almost shocked LSU. And they have a little bit better team this, this year. But the opponent is a little bit better, I guess. But with some of these players not on the team for UConn, it could be a competitive game. Okay, and you said a little while ago that they're not going to get blown out by like 30 points. So what would be your prediction? Ooh, let's see. You know, they have some some outlets saying that Jackson State might win 73, 68, something like that. I hope that's the case. I hope that's the case. You know, me, with me being the Jackson State play-by-play -play boys, I, I don't want them to lose at all. So I'm going to say I'm going to, you know, be biased. If I'm going to be biased and, and then not get fired, I'll say Jackson State wins 72, 68. <laughs> okay, 72, 68. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Rob, you know, I got a problem now that I hear you saying it, man. I do not like the, how they treating you as a legend around there. Not I'm sorry to hear that, the Rob. The media rights. You should be the first person to be able to do it. I, I don't understand why do we do each other like that, Rob? Man, I can't figure that out for the life of me. I can't figure that out at all. I guess when they see the, the, the UConn people or the, the opposing teams uh, sending emails, we want to <laughs> talk with your coach. We want to talk with your coach. Okay, well, I'll have her over there in five minutes. 
And here I am. I need to talk to the coach, too. I get back with you. You know, come on, man. And, and, and I, look, if they get mad at me saying this, I don't care. That's right. You let them know. And, and, and that's big mind. because – and I always talk about the HBCU space, but not necessarily just that. Just people who have been covering the SWAC when nobody else was even watching the SWAC mm-hmm, throughout mm-hmm. the year. And then when you make it to this point, of course, it catches people's attention. They want to know more about you. But th- someone like yourself, myself, Brandy, all of us who continuously do this, I think that should be the first person in line. Then everybody else, you get what you need afterwards. Exactly. And then I'm one of the few people, I don't know if you guys know or not, as I'm announcing the game, I'm trying to shoot the game at the same time. Yeah, you I don't do. Know nobody else who does that? You're a one man band. <laughs> Listen, but uh, I don't know. Maybe we maybe we need to meet about it and, and and discuss it. But that that got under my crawl here at this trip this week. And I feel you on that because I've seen it happen before uh, on numerous occasions. So I definitely understand. I want to ask you this, Rob, before we get ready to let you go. I know you got to get ready to get over to the arena. Have you heard anything about the new format next year for SWAC men and women's basketball about the potential women's game standing along on Thursday, a doubleheader on the weekend, and then the men playing on Monday? Man, what is that about? Yes, I heard that. As a matter of fact, I saw an interview with Charles Edmund of All Four, and he was interviewing Nate Kilbert uh, last week, and Nate said that they're going to vote on this, and this will pass. The women will play on third. Now, what's that going to do for us who announced the game? I, I have no idea. I don't like this at all. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, last week, Ken Richard and I had pros and cons, and we talked about this. And first and foremost, I will say this. I thought women's basketball benefited by being on the ticket with men's basketball, particularly in the SWAC. I know the viewership and the eyes to women's basketball has grown, but for me, I don't think the product of the brand of women's basketball that we have in the SWAC currently, aside from Jackson State, could stand alone on its own. Now, if you ask me, if you wanted more attention towards women's basketball and you wanted more eyes, then how about we just switch the format when we do those double headers and do the men's game first and then do the women's game second. That way you still have people in the arena that will carry over to the women's game. But I'm with you when you're talking about uh, what is that going to do with the broadcast crews? And then can women's basketball, when you look at that operation cost, opening up the gym and those arenas that extra day, will it really generate revenue or the eyes or the interest to be able to stand along by itself? And then Ken Richard also talked about there's a possible television deal that can go along with this, maybe with HBCU Go and ESPN. But it definitely raises a lot of question marks that I feel personally at this point Women's basketball standing along by itself on Thursday night. I don't know if they can sustain that. I don't think so either. Absolutely. Not. I mean, can you imagine a Mississippi Valley State game on third women's game on Thursday night? Come on, man. <laughs> a, a Texas Southern game. These teams are not winning. No, that you are right. To keep the games together, like you said, maybe put the men's game first. They did that. Jackson State tried that once uh, a few years ago. And the attendance was not that when the men's game was over, everybody left. Really? But that was, it was that was of course before Tamika Reed got there. But yeah, man, it, it, uh, that's not gonna work. That that is not gonna work at all, in my opinion. In my opinion. And I like what you said about the broadcast crew because let's just say you're on the Alabama trip, right? The girls play Alabama State on Thursday, then you go up to Huntsville to Alabama A and M on the weekend. Then you have to go back to Alabama State in Montgomery on Monday just to cover the guys' game. Yeah, man, we don't have enough money to do that. Not at all. And then I got another job. I can't be <laughs> <laughs> I can't be leaving. <laughs> That's for real. I mean, this, this is the conversation because, and what I feel members of media and the public should start to have this conversation because it's just how will this sustain itself moving forward if this is the format I don't know us as a conference right now when you look at the brand and the product of what we produce as a whole. Now, you're going to have some teams like a Jackson State. I call Jackson State Big Bad Jackson State, and then it's everyone else. But when you have everyone else, unless Jackson State is in town playing that game high level, bringing that attention, everybody else is just kind of jumbled up there, but yet it's not bringing in media or the fans to watch it. Yeah, I don't know who came up with this idea. I I guess they want to beef up the women's game, which I can appreciate, but I think they need to look 
more into that. Like you said, with the with the broadcast team and the broadcast crew, I don't I don't really think they look at the local the local broadcasters. I don't think they look at the the broadcast. I look because I had a Jackson State administrator. I, we were doing a family game. The, the person called me. My phone was ringing in the middle of the game, so I turned the I turned the volume down and I, I blew my headphones back. I said hello, and they were like. Do you have that video of uh, I, I'm doing a game? <laughs> oh, I didn't know. I, I don't even know the game going on. <laughs> didn't even know the game was going on. Oh, it's it's such a know. disconnect, so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, man. So I don't know. I don't think they. I think they need to take the local broadcast into consideration. They really do. Yes. And last question before I get ready to let you go, Rob. Does Coach Tamika Reed stay or does she leave after this season? In your opinion. Ooh, that is the that is the million dollar question right there. Um, I think it depends on what happens here today. If this game is close, or if they win, if they somehow win, I think she's gone. Yeah. If it's a blowout, she'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell Ashley Robinson get get to the local uh, bank in Jackson, Mississippi, and make that withdrawal and take it straight to Coach Tamika Reed because. It is giving Jackson State a lot of odds, aside from all the things that you had with Coach Deion Sanders when he was there. And, guess you went viral with Coach Sanders every week, it seems, in you guys' interaction. But now to have Coach Tamika Reed to keep the name of Jackson State out there in the mainstream media, to be able to perform the way she's done and build that program to where it is now, will she go down as the best women's basketball coach at Jackson State? Oh, no doubt about it. She's won five straight regular season championships. That has never been done at Jackson State. Yes, yeah, she, already she's the best coach Jackson State has ever had. I mean, you had Sadie McGee, you had all Denise Taylor, you had all these other coaches. Man, she is a great coach, and I, I don't think she gets the recognition she deserves in Jackson. You know, for, for what she's done. These local they, they, Jackson has a lot of local radio shows. They don't even mention Coach Reed. Man, she's done a great job, and, and then she's a, she's a really good person. Um, you know, she's always been fair to me, but that media crew that she's got ain't worth a dime. But she's been <laughs> fair to me, and I just I really appreciate her. I really do appreciate her. And I would really hate to see her go because I covered her when she was at Hines Community College and uh, when she got the job at Jackson State. So, uh, you know, I wish her the best. She, she is, no doubt, the best coach Jackson State has ever had. And I got to give you your flowers as well, Rob. Hey, man, I listen to a lot of your broadcasts when Jackson is playing. I just love the way that you you bring humor to the sport and at the same time you give the real and also bring the game directly to the ears and the, the eyes of anybody that's watching and listening. So you've been around a long time doing this thing, man. I am uh, honored to be able to have you here speaking with us today, to be able to take the time out your busy schedule, man. And as always, man, I appreciate you for what you do, man, because – I personally think you don't get enough recognition for what you do because, like you just said, who else is calling the game and shooting the game at the same time? That's dedication, and I know for sure you love dear Jackson State. Well, I really appreciate that, man. And, I and and, and uh, you know, my daughter attends Southern University. So. Oh. Come on, speak on it. Speak Come on, on it. Come on now. Come on now. That house divided. <laughs> <laughs> Southern man, she, she's uh, she's a journalism major. She's I think she's gonna be pretty good. But I I had uh, Keisha on during my halftime of the SWAC tournament finals, and uh, she was talking about Southern and the bowling team. So let me just send out uh, yes. congratulations to the bowling team. Yes, the Southern bowling. They're about to win the SWAC today, aren't they? Is that today? I believe I got to look at the uh, the the schedule, but uh, I know they had a bye. So it, it throughout the week, I believe it has led up to today. Yeah, well, congratulations, guys. I really appreciate you guys uh, Let me on. I appreciate you, man. You got to uh, share your daughter's information. Maybe we can get on here and get us some some, some radio time, man. For sure. She, she's cut from a good cloth. <laughs> Do that. <laughs> Do that, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. Man, Thank, you, thank you, so you so much. Appreciate you, Rob, and good luck to you guys today against UConn. Going to be a big game. It's tip-off at noon here, Central Standard Time. And, man, I hope they give you all that. Push everybody else out the way. Give Rob J and let him get up there and talk to his own coach. All right? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. I All appreciate right. you. All right. That was Rob J from Jackson State. He's the sports broadcaster, man. A, a phenomenal guy. He's yeah. been around the game a long time. Lots Let's, of good information there. Lots too. of good information. Let's get ready to take a break. We'll come back shortly before we get to the top of the hour. Stay tuned. More of the Jaguar Journal. It's on the yard sports, and I'm Perry White. And what I need for you to do is go follow and subscribe 
to our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter right now. T.R. Ricks is a fifth-year senior who's getting his first chance to drive the train that Bob talked about. And right now, he's driving it quite well because the Southern Jaguars are kicking butt in the SWAC conference. As Bob mentioned, 6-0 overall in the SWAC, and T.R. Ricks has played so well. Over 2,000 yards passing. In the last three games running the football, he's been over 100 yards on the ground. The respect factor that he gets from his teammates is incredible. As a fifth-year senior has never started, they elected him captain. And the numbers he has put up are represented on your screen. 27 total touchdowns on the offense, a pass percentage of nearly 60%. He could be the SWAC player of the year on the offensive side. And they're going to get a huge dose of the best offensive player in the SWAC, and that being Thomas Ricks. Yeah, what Thomas Ricks has found a way to do is just beat defenses either with his arm, with his feet, or with his leadership capabilities, finding a way to win the games late with fourth quarter comebacks. He showed versatility and athleticism. He's a tremendous athlete that knows how to win most importantly. He really is a leader both on and off the field. I just think it has come to a maturity level. Um, you know, uh, I have a four-year-old son, and, you know, when he was born, I had to grow up uh, fast and, you know, just staying in school and, and, and practicing every day, trying to get better every day, you know, just so he can have a better future. Uh, it's, it's just been my inspiration. So, you know, I just think that's, that's my motor that drives me and, you know, keeps me in the game. His four-year-old son, Collier, has not missed a game this season. They throw the football around in Rick's dorm room at Southern, and he says it's great playing football with Collier. First and ten. Rick's has got Vernon. Vernon makes the catch at the 45. They can run the entire offense with all those guys in the game. Rick's to Vernon. First down. Holmes in the backfield. Rick's first down. Gage on the tackle, but not until Ricks picks up the first down. Second and seven. Ricks. Overstreet's got it. Across midfield. Ricks. Has a receiver downfield. It's caught for a touchdown. Territory. Ricks. Fakes the pitch. Gets inside the 15. He's in the type of young men that, that represent his philosophy in life and in football. Rick's in a shotgun. He's going to run it out to the 10. And second and 11 after the holding penalty. Sidearm toss. And a nice catch. Rick's on the first and 10. Little draw play. Takes it outside. He's got the first down. But Rick's going to take it up. All right, it is the Jaguar Journal. Good morning, Perry White here, joining with Miss Brandy B. Harris. Hello. Get, getting it right. <laughs> getting it rocking and rolling this morning. Very interesting interview with my man Rob J. Glad to have him on. Legendary. If you don't know who he is, you need to find out. I'm pretty sure you already do. Legendary guy in the sports broadcasting world. He has covered the SWAC Jackson State for many, many years. He is knowledgeable and a historian. So he's a great guy to be able to talk to. Jackson State, of course, taking on UConn. I know it is the Jaguar Journal. But this time of year, you have to be able to spotlight and put those circle around those big programs that are making names for themselves, right? Yeah. And because they're making names for themselves, it helps the conference as overall because you look at the profile. It then puts eyes on the swag. Never even knew about the swag. Well, yeah. who plays in the swag? Okay, I see Jackson State. I see Southern. I see Grambling. Grambling I yep. see Pine Bluff. You know, you start to then, and that's what matters most and why you have to talk about it. You got to put away your differences when you're talking about all your pride. At the end of the day, when one win, when you talk that about way, that way, right, oh, oh. what? What? Are you saying you got to put away your pride and make it about all of us? No, I'm with you. I agree. I definitely agree. Maybe just I sometimes, said that just like sometimes that. it's like right. sometimes it's like eating broccoli. Like we don't want to do it, but we got to. But Please no, put some cheese or something. Put some on cheese it. on yeah. it. But that's yeah, okay. Right. That's okay. Not, yeah, you got to put some cheese on it. But that is, you're right. It is so important. What's happening right now with the NCAA tournament from Grambling's appearance to now JSU's appearance? I think that's fantastic for the swag. And of course. HBCU has been getting a lot more attention over the last few years. So I like when the attention is on the HBCU in general. So then we can come on, come see Southern. Come on over here. Because now you got me see think, It is still, I don't like Jackson. State, don't. Okay? 
Don't clean that up. Twist it, right? Clean that yeah, up. I'm, that's why I got thank you because Mike was just gonna let me slide with that. No, Come clean on, Mike. that up. Clean that up. I you still, was still a little loose with that. Yeah, clean that up. You're right. I, I don't like. But jazz, we so. but we support all of the HBCUs, and for a light to be shined on the swag means you. that a light is being shined on all of the swag. So that is exciting news. I feel like I should sit on the couch. You're like a psychiatrist. You just you make reel me it get back my life in. He together. gets a little bit too excited. You just gotta yeah. reel it back in. Because you know I was excited. I'm like the swag there. Like, you, you know jumped what? off the ship into the middle of the ocean. Reel it back in. You right. Reel it back in. We got our own boat over here. But as you've been saying, myself. as you've been saying, when the light myself. is being shined on the conference, the light <laughs> is being shined on each of the conferences, individual <laughs> institutions. And that is fantastic news for everybody. So we're going to all rally together. I don't want to say support or cheer on, but we're going to send all of our good vibes and juju to the Jackson State Tigers. I'm going to root for them today. All right, let's get ready to take a break. When we come back on the other side, guess what? We're going to keep it going. We're going to talk some Grambling basketball, right? Coach, with Travy and Scott, uh, the AD up there. Where I almost call him Coach Travy. He, he can be Coach Travy and Scott <laughs> if he wants to. He's the AD. He can sign himself to whatever he wants. So y'all stay tuned. We'll be back more to Jaguar Journal. Southern was a little late to the game of football. They had started earlier in the CIAA up at Hampton and those schools up there. And uh, when Dr. Clark became, J.S. Clark became president of Southern University in 1914, he had already visited Tuskegee and these Howard and the other schools, and they had a football program. And he wanted to compete with them, not just in the classroom, but also on the football field. So it started as an intramural. We had intramurals when we first came in 1914 through 1916-17. And then the intramural program evolved into the varsity, into the football program with no, in 1918. Of course, the big Charlie Holmes from Colorado State, he came here as an assistant coach, but he took over around 1922, 1923, and he did very well uh, through the early 20s, but he came up to 26, uh, uh, he, did, he broke even, he was expected to do well, and 27, uh, I, I don't find any records where he won any games there, and he was replaced. But the person he was replaced by was a legendary, uh, name is uh, Bryce Union Taylor from the University of Southern California. Out there, he had uh, been an All-American. He was the guy that stopped the four horsemen of Notre Dame, and he and uh, then he went to Chaplin University in South Carolina in 27. In 1928, he became the head football coach at Southern University and athletic director, and he really put Southern on the map. He had a lot of firsts. Uh, first of all, he had the first All-Americans we had came under him. Uh, that therefore he had uh, the greatest winning percentage in Southern University. He won 85% of his game here, and he had our first undefeated season in 1931 when he was 7-0, and 0 and, uh, but he was not declared national champ, but he was considered for that. But he was our first great coach during that early period, Bryce Union Taylor. We don't want to forget him. Uh, Arnett W. Mumford, he's a national uh, uh, icon in, the, in, in coaching. He had coached 10 years in Texas, uh, Jarvis Christians, Bishop, and Texas College. But the last uh, five or six years at Texas College, he was very, very outstanding. He had won, he won two swag titles, and he had won a national black championship at Texas College and, and 35. So therefore, uh, Southern was interested in getting him here, and Dr. Uh, Felton Clark was very instrumental in the person to get him here. But his impact, is, is, it goes much further than Southern University State of Louisiana. He won uh, 12 SWAT titles, uh, 10 of them at Southern and two at Texas College, and he won five or six national black championship, uh, uh, championships. And also, he was very successful in the first interracial bowl game. The, uh, the Fruit Bowl in San Francisco in 1948 when he played San Francisco State and uh, he won that game decisively. But his influence uh, uh, extended much further than the boundaries of Southern University. He was recognized nationally as a, as a, as a great coach. His winning record, well, he didn't coach over a period of 35 years, but in a couple of those years they didn't have teams because of the war. But he won 246 games, second only to Eddie Robinson 
with his uh, 402 game over 55 years. Name a star. All right, we are back. It is the top of the hour, 8.02 a.m. Good morning to everybody out there. This is the Jaguar Journal. I'm Perry White, of course. Mrs. Brandy bah, 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 bah. Good morning. <laughs> this is what she does every morning. The coffee is kicking in. There it is. It takes a little while to get my battery going. Now you but felt- once I'm juiced, it's going. <laughs> once the juice is up, it's over. How is it in the morning when you're on WBRZ and you're waking up the entire capital region? How long does it take once you finally get that juice? If you watch closely... My makeup builds uh-huh. into the six o'clock hour. Okay, it, it's virtually impossible for one to be completely one hundred and thousand percent ready at exactly five a.m. Yeah. It takes me a little time. The caffeine has to do its job before we're cranked up. But we're in the eight o'clock hour now, baby. I'm fully awake. <laughs> <laughs> we're juice. Good morning. <laughs> I can definitely hear it too because I got to tell you, say good morning a couple more times at about seven fifteen. Now you ready to rock? Yeah, good and roll. morning. And I'm glad to have you here with me this morning. Glad to have you guys listening with us. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, good morning. Hit that subscribe button as well as the like. If you're listening, go subscribe. And if you want to watch or keep up with us on our Facebook, you can follow at the Jaguar Journal on Facebook. And good morning to those that are watching on the Facebook Live. And good morning to everybody out there listening on the radio waves, whether you're over in Alexandria, the Baton Rouge Capital City area, or down in New Orleans. And so everywhere else in the world, it's good to have you hear our voice. And as we continue to keep the day going, the morning, we got a very special guest this morning. Of course, we're talking Jackson State the last hour. Now we're talking Grambling. And guess what? Grambling men's basketball made it to the NCAA tournament. They won the SWAC. But now, no better person than to have to talk about it. He is the vice president of intercollegiate athletics, Dr. Travian Scott of Baton Rouge Native. Good morning, Dr. Scott. Good morning. Uh, listen, I would say Baton Rouge resident, but I don't want to get myself in trouble. <laughs> uh, I, I want to make sure you can vote where you need to vote, Dr. Scott. <laughs> good, good morning, everybody. How's it going? Man, phenomenal ride for you guys, first of all. You're talking about this season, men's basketball, Grambling State. You guys came up short last year, but then against Texas Southern. Then you get to rematch again this year against Texas Southern. Before we even get into any of that, let's just talk about you, the program, as well as your head coach and Coach Dante and what he's been able to do uh, for you and his relationship for this basketball program. Well, uh, I'll skip talking about me. Um, You know, and I'll go straight to to Coach Jackson and, and what he's been able to accomplish. You know, when I walked in the door, um, August second of twenty twenty one. He was one of my first meetings, and you know we 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 had very honest conversations and dialogues about about what we wanted the program uh, to look like, uh, how he wanted it to look, what the plan was, um, you know, to to continue to build the program. And I think the biggest thing, uh, you know, for me in the conversations that we have with our coaches is understanding uh, the process of of, of you know. You know this continuum of, of of being good, or being below average, being good, being excellent, uh, being great, and being elite. And you know, right now, you know we're 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 just past. Uh, we're we're right at good. Um, you know, we're happy but not satisfied. Um, you know, coach had a plan. Um, you know, he executed the plan really well. Um, in our conversations, again, in those discussions, it was a, really about providing resources and. Uh, you know, access to to certain things that he felt he needed to be successful. We provided those. Um, any athletic director in America will tell you, you know, once a coach starts to ask for things, then of course the admin is going to want a return on investment. I think we got it um, and are receiving it. And, and at the end of last year, um, I think we were 15 and three in the league, 24 and nine uh, overall, the most wins in, in the history of of of, of, of Grandma State basketball. Uh, we gave Coach a four-year extension, and then he turned around this year and, uh, you know, won it again, won the regular season, won the postseason, won the first four, first, uh, you know, back-to-back regular season uh, champions uh, in the NCAA era. It hadn't been done since 1964 when a guy named Willis Reed um, uh, played for, for Gremlin and, and, and before he went to the NBA, of course, uh, with the New York Knicks and, and, and what he was able to accomplish there. So, um, you know, it's been 60 years in the making. Um, you know, we were a five seed in 21. We were a one seed in 22. We were one seed in 23. And we got a lot of positive momentum in trying to, again, go from good to great, uh, you know, and, and trying to establish ourselves as an elite force uh, for the sake of basketball, since we're talking about basketball. Uh, 
you know, at Grambling. And so, you know, that's the mission. That's the goal. Um, you know, we've, we've been able to extend that to women's basketball. I think we've done some great things there uh, in trying to build that process out. But, but like you said, since we're talking about men's basketball, I'll, I'll stay there. Really excited, really happy about what Coach Jackson has been able to accomplish. His guys, his assistant coaches, uh, you know, are really carving copies of him. They align with his goals very well. Um, you know, his student athletes. Listen, we played four sophomores the other night, you know, and we've got great senior leadership. Um, you know, Tremichael Moten will, will go down as, 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 as a Gremlin legend. He's been with us for five years. I believe he had something like 21 last night. He, uh, the, the swag semis, he was just unconscious. He had 26. And, you know, he's just a guy who makes uh, big shots. He's very opportunistic. He's not afraid of the moment. He plays well. We're going to miss him. Um, you know, with all the talent that we have, I don't know if, you know, you could really come across a guy with, with that moxie and that skill set, um, you know, for us in terms of a leadership role. And Jordan Smith, the New Orleans native, I believe he transferred from Coastal Carolina, another a lefty, uh, really crafty with the basketball in his hand, can shoot it, can shoot the mid-range, uh, super athletic. Uh, you miss those guys and the leadership that, that they brought to our program. And, and again, understanding that, uh, we've got a pretty good contingent of student athletes coming back, young talent. Um, obviously, with the transfer portal and recruiting, that'll be beefed up a bit. But we're really excited about where we are. Um, you know, back-to-back championships is nothing to to sniff at. But but going back to my earlier sentiments, um, you know, we're we're happy, but we're not satisfied. What was so interesting about it, and I think for a lot of people, I did not realize Gremlin had never been to the NCAA tournament, and that came as a huge surprise. And I guess. Everything gets so clouded with you think of Grambling, you thinking about Grambling football. And, of course, you talked about Grambling's women's basketball. I'd be remiss if I did not shout them out for going to the WNIT and getting the victory in round one. But for Grambling men's basketball, Dr. Scott, I did not know you guys had never been to the NCAA tournament up until this year. Then you no. go into the tournament, you take on Montana State, and most importantly, I saw a tweet that was out there was saying that over the next few years, several years, because of that victory you guys got in the NCAA tournament in that first play-in game against Montana State, $2 million will be spread out over the conference. Talk about that that impact along with you guys going to the tournament and getting – not only did you go to the tournament for the first time, you won a tournament game your first time going. Well, I'll say this, and, and I know there was some – uh, some communications. I wouldn't call it chatter about, uh, you know, Gremlin basketball, Gremlin history, Coach Hobby, what he's been able to accomplish. You know, it, 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 the, the fact of the matter is we, we all stand on the sh- on the shoulders of giants and our forefathers and, and those legends who paved the way at Gremlin, um, you know, which which includes, of course, uh, but not limited to Coach Hobby. Uh, again, since we're in the basketball space, um, but the reality of it is, Grambling State University has never participated in the NCAA tournament. Not, we're not talking about a SWAG championship. We're not even talking about a SWAG tournament, you know, in a Division two days. We're talking about being a part of the field of 64, now 68. It's something that's never been accomplished, and it's something uh, that we're proud of. Now, in that pride, of course, there's always an acknowledgement of those who, again, came before us uh, and, and really – you know, highlighted and made Grambling basketball uh, what it is. And so we're, we're as equally as proud of that. Uh, in terms of, of the revenue distribution from the Southwestern Athletics Conference and the NCAA, I, I would just say this. Um, you know, whenever you win, uh, you know, obviously you, you have the opportunity to generate additional revenues. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, conversation or discussion about our conference in, in, as it relates to the play-in game. Uh, I am a fan of the play-in game, and the reason why is because it gives you an opportunity to win and generate what's called units. Um, This year, the the NCAA uh, revenue distribution unit is a little south of $342,000 per year for five years, and while those units do, uh, of course, go to the Southwestern Athletics Conference, they filter directly to the institution. So, you know, uh, Grambling State University Athletics and Grambling State University and Grambling State University uh, basketball, uh, you know, will 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 make out, you know, pretty well, um, you know, as a result of, of winning that first four game. But I think the biggest thing for us is how does that reinvestment look? It's one thing to to win it one time. It's another thing again to go from good to great, and to have some type of continuum of excellence. You have to make an investment. 
uh, you know, because in my mind, you know, what, what if what if we're able to get back next year? And if we don't get back next year, what if we're able to get back uh, to the to the first four and potentially win a game two years from now? Well, you got a steady income stream coming in, you know, for this victory, and then in two years you got another five years, and then in two years or three years or whatever. You know, I have a saying that everybody's on scholarship, so you're not going to win it every year. I mean, it's just not realistic, right? Um, but what you try to do is 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 to really build a, a sustainable model. Uh, of excellence within your program so that, you know, you do realize the financial benefits of winning. Um, and that comes with an initial investment. And, 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 and when you're able to get to the NCAA tournament, then there's, you know, $1.7 to $2 million waiting on you. And I think next year, I think it's going to go up probably another 25 to 3%. So anywhere from three hundred forty five dollars to $355,000 for a unit next year for, for winning a tournament. Now, if you look at it and you go back and you say, well, if Gremlin won one game and it's $1.7, $1.8 million, then what does it look like for teams that are winning two games, three games, four games, final fours? Well, do the math, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a business that, you know, of course, um, it can, can pay off handsomely, but, you know, we've got to do the work as athletic administrators and understand what it's like to be able to build, again, sustainable models of excellence. And that comes, of course, with administrative support in the president's office and, uh, being able to understand and identify, uh, you know, the requisite leadership for our program, someone who fits our institution but can coach, can recruit, can develop, can mold, cares about academics, um, you know, understand understands um, the total picture of what it means to be a coach and a leader at our schools. Obviously, we don't have, um, you know, $13 million budgets. I was reading something last night where I believe Yale invests maybe about $2 million uh, into their basketball program, and Auburn invests you know, 10, 12, 13 million. Well, you saw the result of the game. Um, you know, but you've got to find a coach that, that fits where you are, uh, but, but mindset isn't limited to what you have. And I think that's the biggest thing for us with Coach Jackson uh, is, is that we've been able to, you know, again, um, you know, allow him to really craft a team in his own image. Um, you know, allow him to lead those men to recruit, to develop, and he's done a stellar job uh, throughout my tenure here at Grandma State University. Dr. Scott, do you have a second to hang on as we take a break? Yeah, man, I'm good. All I'm right, let's get ready to take a break, pay some bills. We'll come back. Y'all stay tuned more to Jaguar Journal. Darius Skelton has really had this wave of momentum for Southern. Yeah, first year per player in this program. I love his decision making. He makes quick decisions, particularly when running the run pass option game. That's his specialty. He's been an impact for this offense since he took over as starting quarterback. Well, the Darius Skelton is a dual threat uh, quarterback. He can throw the football. He's very good at throwing the ball down the field. Uh, we're going to work on this spring those intermediate passes, but down the field, he's one of the better down the field passes that I've seen. Play action, Skelton going for it all, has a man, and hauling it in is Hunter Register. And then when you talk about running ability, he has uh, running back capabilities. He can go the distance. He has the speed to go the distance. He has the power, to, and he has the vision. And I think when you put that with a dual threat quarterback, I think he's the reason why we're so happy about this coming season. Skelton feeling the pressure. Skelton eludes a couple of tacklers. He's still on his feet. Oh, wow. oh, little shake and big jump move, baby. Being a quarterback is man, it's not easy at all. It was hard being here and having the expectations to be the starter and not being the starter. It just it it was overwhelming. Like I was ready to play and not playing when I was ready to play just made me kinda of look at life differently and really think should I be here or should I not? And I talked to God and he just settled me down and he told me to be patient. That's what I did. Skelton, who started the last six games of 2018 for the Jaguars. They went 5-1. and one. They're only lost to Alcorn State in the SWAC title game. Taking the jet weep, and Skelton awfully good with his leg. Blitz. Register the receiver at the bottom of your screen. Nice grab. Watch. All have had an impact here in the year lowing. Southern stuff. Skelton comes up for the third time. 
Taking the jet sweep, he'll keep it. A good lead block as he cuts it to the outside. And the fake to Ben. Skelton will run. And dragging with them for a few yards. There he goes. The time stepping up into the end zone has registered. Flag down, catch made, touchdown, and it's actually first quarter yards. Southern 121, McNeese 40. Fresh set of downs as we begin the second quarter and looking deep, Skelton for register. What's going on, everybody? I am Perry White. I'm the host of the Jaguar Journal. I want to make sure that you guys tune in live each and every Saturday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 107.3 FM. We also. All right, Mr. Scott, thank you for joining us. We have Travion Scott, athletic director for Grambling State University, joining us this morning. It is the Jaguar Journal. This is the Jaguar Journal. Good morning. Happy Saturday to everybody. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful Saturday. We're shaping up to be a beautiful Saturday here in Baton Rouge. But if you didn't know, Grambling State Tigers, let's, let's run through the stats as they just wrapped up a historic season. Big congratulations to the Graham fam, back-to-back -back regular season champs, Conference tournament champions, first time in school history, first NCAA tournament appearance, first NCAA tournament win, and a call from the vice president of the United States. So, Mr. Scott. Dr. Scott. Dr. Put Scott. That respect put that now. respect on it. Doc, with all of those accomplishments that the Gremlin State University basketball team, the men's basketball team, has been able to accomplish this season, what will that do for recruiting going into next season? <laughs> Um, I don't know what it'll do for recruiting necessarily. I, I just know that, that our guys are, are working really hard um, and have been all year really to, to establish relationships with, you know, some of the top student athletes in the country. And so, you know, I don't necessarily know, uh, you know, like right now, uh, you know, I, I just think our guys work hard. I mean, this is, this is what we expect. Um, you know, based on the work that that's put in. So, you know, I, I would imagine, of course, that that recruiting would would, uh, you know, would spike a little bit, um, depending on how you look at it. But, you know, it's so cyclical. Um, you know, obviously, you're dealing with 18 to 22 year olds, sometimes 23. I've seen kids get as many as eight years of eligibility these days, man. You never know. <laughs> they call me, um, man. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think the biggest thing, you know. And 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 and, and I, I really want to hit and land on this point is that, you know, you you got you you got some some pretty great talent, uh, you know, out here. Um, obviously, the high school game is 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 taking a bit of a beating because of the transfer portal. Um, you know, you've got really junior, really good junior college student athletes. You've got you know, Power Five student athletes transferring over. For us, it's it's really about, you know being able to fit who we are, what we do with being a certain type of student athlete, right? And, you know, sometimes we pass on better talent for, for, for guys who fit the mold of what we're looking for. And so, you know, I, 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 while, we're, while we're talking about recruiting, spiking, and all of the good things that, that, that basketball has done, basketball and Coach Jackson under his leadership is going to look for a certain type of student athlete. So, you know, it, it may be, you know, a student athlete with a lesser name, with with more upside, who understands his vision, his culture, um, and the direction of his program. It's somebody who wants to be in alignment. Now, I will say this, and I would be very, very remiss if I didn't add, um, you know, exactly what what, what our mission is as as as, as, as an athletic department. Um, you know, and it, it it starts with being the subset of the institution. So, yeah, basketball did an incredible job. Um, you know, last week and the week before. Uh, but but think about what that does for Grambling State University. Um, and, and, and think about the, the exposure all the way back to the SWAG tournament. I believe we played, um, I think the women may have played Alcorn and the men may have played, who was that? Uh, Bethune-Cookman. Uh, we were on ESPN from 10.45 in the morning until about 3.30, nonstop. Yeah, have Grambling Athletic, but Grambling State University. So that means that the world famed Tiger March and Pep Band was on full display. Um, our national championship, defending national championship cheer team was, was on full display. Um, all of the good news of Grambling State University was on full display for six hours before we made the NCAA tournament, mm -hmm. right? 
And so, you know, we, we were one for two. I was, you know, I, I really, really wanted to win both of those championships, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but, you know, we, we, we had an opportunity then to be the only game in town on, on Wednesday night. We, we struggled early, but, you know, a typical Dante Jackson team makes great adjustment and, and continues to fight. And they pulled it out. Uh, you know, and then all the way to last night where, you know, we played a very good uh, Zach Eady led Purdue team. And, 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 and again, the guys continued to fight, and, and we just didn't have enough. And so, you know, it's, it's great for recruiting. It's great, um, you know, for, for our coaches who, who are going to, you know, go and try to amass talent with talent that aligns with what we're trying to do. But it's even better for our institution. Um, you know, to be on the forefront of, of everybody's minds for the last two weeks. Think about what that does for admissions applications, what that does for student morale, what that does for faculty and staff morale, you know, how we carry the message of moving Grambling State University forward. And that's basically our role as athletic practitioners in, in, in understanding how to extend the brand as I watched Zach Eadie dunk on us last night. Um, how to get the <laughs> uh, of State University. Well, Dr. Scott, let me ask you this because um, I think you're you're making an excellent point. That's two Jaguars. Well, I recognize that you even though, to. like I said earlier, it's like eating broccoli, giving y'all all this credit and praise, but it does shine a light not just on um, Grambling but on HBCUs. And obviously, like you said earlier, y'all are developing or you're wanting to develop a culture, or a continual culture of excellence. Let me ask you about this. Grambling State Tigers got a very important phone call before this NCAA tournament appearance from the vice president. that yes. Does that add to what you're saying about shining a light on Grambling State University? Because the internet streets were very excited to see <laughs> that the vice president of the United States called the Grambling State basketball team to congratulate him. Well, well I, I, I'll give you a small fact. Uh, the, the, the vice president called me the night we won. And when they were explaining what they wanted to um, I was almost, I was in fan mode. I really didn't hear any of what was said. I had to ask. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, it, it was a great opportunity. Um, you know, everybody knows that the vice president of the United States is, is, is a proud graduate of, of, of an HBCU. And, uh, you know, she she explained that she watched the game. I remember seeing her you know, standing up at the Celebration Bowl in, in in December. So she's a huge fan of all things HBCU. And, uh, you know, we wanted to, or she wanted to, uh, of course, pull the team together and uh, offer them encouraging words. And I kind of held it, uh, didn't tell Coach Jackson. I just said, hey, you know, when, when, when we get an opportunity, I'm going to get a phone call and I need to be able to pull you guys together really quickly. Obviously not want to interrupt his normal flow. Uh, of how he conducts his road trips. Obviously, we're here to win the game, but this is the vice president of the United States of America. And so, uh, you know, he graciously obliged, and, and, and we got the guys together and our coaches together, and uh, they had an opportunity to, to, to you know, really, uh, you know, advance some, some dialogue and, and, and share what she thought was a great night uh, on behalf of, not just Grandma State University, but HBCUs. And, um, you know, he, he got some well-deserved kudos and flowers, and I couldn't be happier uh, for he and his coaching staff and his team. Uh, you know, and then there was a, a, a very great, uh, very good video that, that was posted uh, from the vice president's office, and I believe the vice president's mm -hmm. social media handles that we were able to share and capitalize on again. You know, advancing the mission of, of Gremlin uh, through the light of, of, of athletics and men's basketball. Um, you know, and it was it was it was it was great. Um, you know, we we've gotten you know calls, um, texts, emails. Uh, Any checks? Uh, we got a couple of those too. <laughs> That's why uh, they can call and text. Where that check at? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and listen, you know, and, and we always talk about fundraising, but but fundraising is equally as important, right? And so. You know, we we've gotten uh, the president of, of Adidas North America reached out. Uh, uh, a Baton Rouge native and, 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 and good friend of mine, Fred O'Bank, did a hype video last night. I mean, there. I mean, there's this again. People are reaching out, and, and checks are being written. All right. Uh, you know, and, and attention is is certainly well deserved, and we're excited about uh, that and and what we're going to be able to do moving forward.
Dr. Scott, I got to ask you this question because I just had the conversation with Rob J. I had the conversation with Ken Rashad last week and just been having a conversation with people around. It seems that next year, and you guys are the Swag Men's champion, your women came up short, won a WNIT uh, game, but more importantly to the conference, next year the format seems that it is going to change the way men and women basketball are playing uh, played in the conference when you look at the conference format. Women seem they're going to have their own standalone game on Thursday. Then it's going to be a doubleheader on the weekend, and then it seems the men are going to play a long standalone game on Monday. Uh, as an athletic director, what are your thoughts when you look at this and some pros and cons uh, if this do does come out to be true that this format is going to look like this moving forward? So, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's news now. I'll confirm it is true. Um, I, I will confirm that I did vote for it. Um, and, and I did for a couple of reasons. And I'll, I'll start with the Monday night game. I think, you know, sometimes the Monday night games kind of run over. Um, our student athletes have, have class the next morning. Um, you know, typical basketball, when you play on Monday night, you're usually off on Tuesday. Um, and, and not being able to predict um, the women's games, obviously sometimes they run long overtime and things of that nature. Uh, we played the men 30 minutes after the women. And that those games have started this year as late as nine nine thirty, right? And so, you know, finishing those games at the eleven o'clock hour and expecting our student athletes to travel home and go to class the next morning just wasn't ideal. Um, secondarily, and I probably should have led with this: what a great opportunity it is for um, now both of our sports to have the ability to have their own night, specifically uh, women's basketball across the Southwestern Athletics Conference, obviously. Um, everybody sees what, what Coach Reed is doing at Jackson State and uh, what Coach Simmons is doing at Gremlin. But the, the women's basketball platform has increased substantially in our league over the course of the past two or three years, right? And so, you know, being able to have a Thursday night where women's basketball is on the docket by themselves, right? They're the only ball game in town. Um, you know, and, and again, 6, 6 p.m., 9 o'clock, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you're out of there. Saturday, we keep our double headers. On Monday, we highlight the men, and it gives us an opportunity as we continue to to grow our league, um, you know, with with different platforms and, and, and media bases, um, you know, to move forward. And I think it's a again, it's a great thing. It's a great opportunity to continue to extend the brand imagery of the league, uh, but it also uh, allows our student athletes to be students, um, and allows our, our women's basketball programs to continue to increase and, and evolve and enhance by having their own nights on Thursday, um, you know, TV can pick those up again. We talk about checks, more revenue is generated at that point because now on Thursday you're talking about women's basketball. Um, of course there's an opportunity on Saturdays, but on Saturdays you start games earlier. We started games as early as 11 o'clock in the morning in this league, depending on TV, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people start at three. I believe, you know, my, my, my thought is to try to get it, get in and out probably 2 to about 6, 6.30, uh, so that folks can enjoy their Saturday evening. But different ADs have different philosophies. Uh, but on, on, on the weekends, you can start those games earlier. Sunday generally is a travel day. Um, now that travel day has, has changed to men's basketball, and Friday has changed as a travel day for women's basketball. Uh, and then on Mondays, the men, of course, will be able to close the weekend out with the similar opponent of the women on Thursday. Uh, and they be the only ball game in town. And again, that 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 plays a significant role when you start talking about monetizing uh, our brands, monetizing our conference uh, from a distribution standpoint. Because now you've got a game that can be picked up three days um, a week as opposed to two. So, you know, that's my thought, my two cents. Um, there'll be more announcements coming soon. Again, we've got a a great contingent of, of, of presidents, uh, very savvy contingent of athletic directors and, and, and senior woman administrators and so we're going to continue to push the envelope uh, as best as possible for our students for our student athletes and for our institutions now rob jay said what that's going to do about the broadcasting crews if we in alabama and he said we're playing alabama state and a and m and if i got alabama state with the women on on thursday night in montgomery then i got to go to huntsville over the weekend the double header then i got to go back to the montgomery on monday he, Rob J kind of has some, some, his pros and cons with the saying, what that's going to do with the broadcast crews across the conference that broadcast these games, both men and women for their uh, prospective schools. 
Yeah, and, and, and those are some valid points. Um, you know, I would just say that that when we're in the room, we're we're concerned about the student athlete. Um, That's you know, definitely think, it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think I think we're. I, but I, I but 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 to his point, um, because because Rob J is 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 a significant figure in our league from a broadcast standpoint. So you can't underscore his concern. Uh, but I, I feel like what we need to do because we we all depend on mass media, right? So you can't discount that. Whether it's you know whether it's broadcast, whether it's social media, whether it's, it's print media, journalism, it still exists and it's still vital to our overall brand. Uh, but but what I think is going to call for us for for us to be able to adjust to it from an administrative standpoint and provide resources uh, for the Rob Jays of the world, for the the, the Perry Davises of the world. Uh, you know, who broadcast games and cover games throughout our league, right? So now you're talking about uh I give you an example. If 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 uh Southern Grambling basketball are travel partners, right? So essentially we play the same people on the same on opposite days. So if Grambling goes to Alcorn on Thursday, then that means Southern goes to Jackson on Thursday. When? All right, so that means Gramlin will go to Jackson on Saturday and play a doubleheader. And then the men will follow up with Alcorn on Monday. So it's 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 still regional, right? You're still you're still within a certain mileage standpoint from for, from a travel standpoint. Uh unless you talk about uh obviously Bethune Cookman and in in, in in Florida A and M, which Ooh, is that's a little strange. farther. Yeah, which is a little farther in distance, but when you're talking about, you know, Southern Gramlin, three hours and 27 minutes. I make the drive all the time. Don't debate me, right? Uh, you start talking about uh, Alcorn and Jackson. That's an hour and 30 minutes. You start talking about Alabama State a and I believe that's a little over two hours. So they're, they're relatively short drives, uh, short commutes from one of those campuses to the other. Um, you know, but we can and we still have the opportunity and the ability to adjust for the betterment uh, of our media programs and teams. Well, Dr. Travian Scott, I wanted to say thank you for coming on this morning. Great discussion. I kind of, I, I want to kind of give that breaking news what you just said because it's the first time we heard it from an official, an administrator mm -hmm. of this league. So for you to be able to give us some insight uh, on that and what it's going to look like next year, appreciate you for that. And most of all, congratulations to you guys uh, with your swag victory winning the tournament. You, you 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 just swept past Southern this year. A lot of Jaguar fans weren't too happy about that, but swept past us. But getting an opportunity for you guys, man, to uh, go to the NCAA tournament to get that viewership, that audience, and what that means for your program. Congratulations to you on that, and congratulations also to your women's basketball team winning that first round of the WNIT. Uh, they're still in contention, so man, good things happening up there at Grambling. He is a Southern Jag for everybody. Put it on, listening. come on. So uh, Jaguars at work, baby. Come on, That's all we're gonna always say. end it on a Jaguar note. I want to hear him say go Jags, <laughs> but I know. Uh, <laughs> He well, you're wanna... being messy this morning, Perry. <laughs> it's too early. We're not being Look, messy before 9 a.m. You, you, you could be as messy as you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you 10 and a half times out of 10 that this is the G. All right. Oh, my okay. Scott. That's enough of that. That's, That's enough. enough. That's enough. <laughs> Dr. Scott, thank you for coming on this morning, man. Appreciate it. Very insightful and entertaining, man, as always. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you for having me. Have a good morning. All right. All right, let's get ready to take a break, pay some bills. Brandy and I will be right back. Stay tuned. More to the Jaguar Journal. It's on the yard sports, and I'm Perry White. And what I need for you to do is go follow and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter right now. For the first time in the 79-year history of the Southwestern Athletic Conference Elite Championship game determines the overall champion today, live from Legion Field in Birmingham, Alabama. It's the champions of the East, Jackson State, taking on Southern, the champs from the West. Hello, everybody. George Johnson along with Charles Mann. And I got to tell you, a great poet once said, this is the way it's supposed to be. And it is number 11 Southern taking on number 15 Jackson State. Both programs have won three SWAC titles of the decade. So it's only fitting in the first SWAC championship game we determine the program of the decade. We've got a lot of offense out on the field. And yet this guy right here, he's going to tell you this game's all about D. It's always all about <laughs> D, George. You know that. It's always all yeah, about an D. An all-pro defensive man is going to tell you that. When you think about 
about Jackson State. This is a team that is very potent offensively, but defensively, they've led the SWAC throughout most of the year. They've got the best player in defense in the SWAC, and that's Tommy Head. Tommy Head. Get, the, get used to saying that name. You'll say it all day. He'll be all over the field. He's always around the football. He's the leading tackler on this team. He also has five and a half sacks. At one point this year, Southern led the nation in scoring defense. Then they ran into Florida a and They've got a lot of guys out there that can get it done. But at the top of the list is DeMarcus Miller. DeMarcus Miller, the linebacker coach, Terrence Graves, told me there's one word to describe this kid, and that is relentless. He's only 5'10", 285 pounds. He makes a lot of plays, though. Relentless, appropriate word for our third member of the broadcast team, and that's Joe Claire, who's standing by down on the sideline. Joe? Yes, indeed. I'm down here on the field capturing all the pageantry and revelry that is black college football. Birmingham, Alabama is a lovely city. This is the inaugural SWAC championship in their city, so they came out to have a good time. I will be covering the fans, the cheerleaders, shout-outs, all that kind of stuff. Back to you guys up top. All right, thank you very much, Joe. You know, earlier this year, Southern beat Jackson State, the fourth straight win over the Tigers. But what's most impressive about Southern, they haven't lost a conference game in 25 outings. They put it on the line against Jackson State. We look at the starting lineups brought to you by Western Union Money Transfer, the fastest way to send money worldwide. You saw the backs. Here's your offensive line. Damon Nivens is a first-team all-SWAC member. Defensively, there's your starting lineups for Jackson State's defense. Chandler, Tommy Head, Edward Reese, pretty good middle linebacker. Rashard Anderson is a professional prospect. And they say he will be in the NFL next year. But there's your starting lineup. Brought to you by Western Union. Mark Washington is your quarterback. Destin Wright, the all-time leading rusher in school history, is the tailback. Jeremiah G. Todd. All right, we are back. It is the Jaguar Journal about five minutes before we get to another break. Good morning to everybody out there listening. Be sure to hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. We're trying to get to a thousand subscribers and we can't do it by ourselves. I can only hit the button one time. Brandy can only hit the button one time. Mike can only hit the button one time. So you get plenty of other people out there to hit the button. I'm sure we can get there. We're, we're knocking on the door of that. So you guys hit that subscribe button, hit the yes. like button if you're watching yes. and paying attention because our YouTube channel gives, gives us an opportunity to reach the world. There are Jaguar alums and HBCU fans and just people that love to hear this information all across the world. So we try to give them the information from many different point of views. Yes. So share this. Get that out there to them as well as on our Facebook channel. I, I want to kind of talk about some of the stuff, what some of the news about? that we just got out of um, our conversations this morning with our guests. Let's talk about this, this big news that we about? just broke this morning on women's basketball playing on Thursday night, splitting up the men's and women ticket. Yeah. And the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of that. I'm not a fan of it. I'll just throw that out there. Why? Uh, as much as he said it gives an opportunity, I'm like with Rob J. Uh, it's the people that's in between. I get this about the student athlete, but for me personally, for one, I'm going to say I don't think women's basketball in this conference is strong enough to stand on its own when you're looking for viewership and when you're looking for attendance. It's not to say anything bad about the programs. I just think it benefits when they work together. But I do understand what he's saying playing late into the evening on Mondays. That makes a big deal uh, when you're looking at probably the men's game sometime tipping off at 7.30, 8 o'clock. But to split that, I'm just not a fan of it. I know he tried to – he used Alcorn because Alcorn isn't a far place to go back and forth when you're looking at Grambling and Southern as travel partners. But I think about the Florida schools, the Alabama schools, you are stretching thin staff on top of you're paying officials because now – well, it's, it's still the same when you look at the officials because you're still going to have to pay them. But now officials have to travel more going back and forward as well. And it's just a lot of other things that I think the conversation has to be had on. It, what's really the benefit? I get the possibility of television added to it. But what's really the benefit of it is all I'm asking. I'm going to say this. In 2020, I had a colleague of mine who commented that nobody wants to watch women's basketball. Mm -hmm. And I would argue... Some you've just decided that no one want, wants to watch women's basketball. I would argue that anytime you have something, especially at HBCUs, whereas going back to what I said earlier, it's such a community hub that you're gonna have, you're gonna be bringing in audience that maybe you weren't bringing in because the games were going into the late night. Because as always, our HBCU campuses are quite literally community hubs. 
I see this as an opportunity. I think that there are benefits for it being an opportunity. And I'm one of those people that appreciates change and appreciates at least let's just try and see what happens. We can always go back. We can always go back to the way, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think that I'm seeing it as an opportunity, especially for the student athletes. As he said, when you focus on them, one thing I hear from student athletes all the time, they feel like they don't get enough attention. And I know that when you have those type of back-to-back -back games, girls are going to, there's always going to be that type, that thing. You know what I'm saying? But when you have your own day that is designated for you and for your conference, for the other people in your industry, you feel, you just feel different. So I'm, 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 Excited to see what the conference can do with the opportunity. I'm going to laugh at it because I feel if you feel like you're not getting enough attention now, you damn sure not going to get as much more attention when you stand along by yourself. I ask people, if, if you look around the conference, and this is a real conversation, look at attendance at women's basketball game in this conference and do not measure, not for you but anybody, mm -hmm. measure women's basketball in the SWAT compared to what we watch with LSU Dude, and right. South no, Carolina. No, I get that. Right? I definitely get that. that the resources a, are different, but and it, now you're going to have to put, now you're going to have to put a different kind of attention and resource on it in order to get the people there. Do you think that cuz my personal opinion is that's already not in place, right? We're already mm -hmm. not marketing and promoting our Agreed. games that we already mm -hmm. have on our current schedule enough to get people there. I saw the same thing with the Swag Basketball Tournament in Birmingham. I didn't feel the marketing towards that game to sell it to the city of Birmingham and as well as to sell it to people around the conference to come to Birmingham and support your team, right? Everybody waits to the weekend to see who's going to get to the championship. Understandable. But the, the reason of having it in the city of Birmingham is to get the city out. Now, I know there's a lot of things that goes into it. I personally just didn't see it. And if, if seeing it for me means having to see it from social media standpoint, because that's how I'm judging marketing these days mm -hmm. and branding, I didn't see that personally from the conference, and I currently don't see it when we do have the doubleheader games and weekly games from our institutions that we don't put enough excitement behind Exposure. basketball right now to be able to sell what we have. So now you're asking me to sell a whole day by itself and to ramp up selling my women's basketball program, in which I'm already not doing. That's just kind of where I guess my issue. I don't have a problem with it being with the way that it is. My thing is... I don't foresee us doing the right things going to do by those women's basketball games by themselves to give them that exposure and that marketing to brand them alone. Agreed. And to go back to what you said earlier, I think my only concern, I, I pers I'm still going to say, I think I look at it as an, as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. If they haven't been doing something now, have an opportunity to start doing that. Cause you kind of going to, you're going to have to, but what you just said of, Let's not compare our conference and the way our girls perform to any of those big D1 schools like mm -hmm. we've been talking about earlier, the Yukons, the LSU. Mm -hmm. We are not them. So what are we going to be able to do with the resources that we have yet to be seen? Women's basketball is definitely going to have to be supported as well by the, 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 the community, the, the, the female, the, fans. the women organizations on campus. I believe the women's sororities. This is the time when you look at for the, the, the community of women, right? But not just women, but that's the that's but the I thing. That's the competitive where it has to start. the competitive spirit. I I would say that within the university, we got they got enough organizations on campus, men and women, that they could be the beginning of. I think that's a great idea of having those organizations, not just the women's organizations, but those Greek, those Divine Nine organizations, some of those other service and social organizations being a part of going to them Thursday night games and then hitting up the Friday night games. Because let me ask y'all out there: How was last? How often do you decide? that you're going to the women's basketball game by itself. You typically, and I know when I'm going to these games, you trickle in towards the end of the women's basketball game to catch the men's basketball. That means the branding and the product is going to have to go up tremendously in terms of what we're doing. You're going to have to create some excitement behind women's One basketball. One thing I've seen in a lot of sports entertainment, I'm sure a lot of folks out there, if you go to different games and events around just athlete, athletics in general, not just at Southern, but athletics in general, there's a huger focus on in-game entertainment, on fan first, on what is the what do fans get out of their ticket today? Not just coming to see the game. What else do they get out of this event? I think if the creativity and the resources are put into that, you're going to see more because if I'm just going for the four quarters, that's one thing that's going to pull me there. But some of that other stuff that gets you there, some of those, again, making it more, continuing to focus on it being a community hub. I just see this as an opportunity. If given the right attention, if the right people are in place, to set this up and see it as a forward thinking, you know, opportunity.
They gonna have to show me, Brandy. <laughs> Perry say they, he's skeptical, they, honey. They he is skeptical. Me. He is he is uh, skeptical about it. So we're gonna have to see. I'm I'm excited to see what this can mean, at least for the swag. Let's just focus in and see what they can do with it. Let's see what Jackson State can do with it. Let's see what Grambling can do with it. And there there may be some um winning routines there, some winning opportunities there. All right, well, I know we got a caller. Let's take a quick break right quick. We'll come back, and then we'll go straight to the caller. So, Sam, hold on. So, you guys stay tuned. We'll be back more to the Jaguar Journal. Your home is... It's on the yard, sports, and I'm Perry White, and what I need for you to do is go follow... Watching the Sutter University Human Jukebox. Click here to watch more videos. And don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. What's going on, everybody? I am Perry White. I'm the host of the Jaguar Journal. I want to make sure that you guys tune in live each and every Saturday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 107.3 FM. We also have our affiliates in Alexandria, Louisiana, as well as down in New Orleans. And if you're not able to catch us on Radio Live, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow us on Facebook. It's the Jaguar Journal. We are back. It is the Jaguar Journal. Good morning. I'm Perry White. She missed Brandy B. Harris. Let's go to the phone lines. We got Sam on the line. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. How you doing today? Doing good, man. Dude, I agree with you. Uh, I kind of find it hard to, uh, for even locally, that you can you can leave your work on a Thursday with, your, with a, having a kid or grandkid in school and go get the game when you can go catch both games on Saturday. And it's not ideal for traveling for the for, – for the ones the fans that's gonna be going to the game, but I'm, I'm a rich from Russell, Louisiana. I can't go to Grambling on a Thursday to see a game and then come back on a Saturday to see a game because that's gonna entail me spending money at the hotel up, up in the in the area. It's mm -hmm. a big loss. Yeah, and then uh, like you said about the fishing, and you have to look at the ad, average age group. You know, I'm an alumni of Southern University class of '76, and I'm 50, 75 years old. We are retired, and we're not gonna travel like that. Uh, the swag has not come to that level yet of, of playing. The teams like Jackson State, Grambling is coming up, Arkansas, Pine Bluff, Alabama, they in there, Prairie View, and FAMU, and BC, uh, uh, Bethune Cookman, they can give you surprise games, but nobody's going to travel that distance just to watch them play. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Sam, man, and, and thank you for calling in this morning, man. I appreciate it as always. And anybody else, 
We got a couple minutes, 225-499-1073 if you want to call in and uh, give your opinion. 225-499-1073 is the number. And the harsh reality before we move on and talk about, of course, Chancellor Pierre, John Pierre being named the Chancellor of SUBR. I was, Brandy and I were having a, a discussion off air, and it, it, is, it is a much-needed discussion I think has to be had for a lot of people now that we know this is going to be official. The harsh reality of it is, people, that our fans, when you look at the HBCU, let's just say the SWAC space, we are football fans. As much as we cry that we like baseball and basketball and all of those other sports, the harsh reality of it is most of y'all don't give a damn about what's going on with the basketball. You don't care about this or that. You wait until it gets to the conference tournament and you wait to a team like Grambling and Jackson who have put themselves to play for the NCAA tournament. That's when you come out and you look. But the harsh reality of it is we do not treat the rest of the sports like we do football. Now, when you look at the other sports and you're talking about women's basketball in the PWI world, those people will show up to support 20,000 at a gymnastics meet. We ain't going to no gymnastics meet. I'm here to tell you. Right, we're not going to a tennis game. We don't. We barely even showing up to softball or baseball. That support, then, and this is the conversation I always have when you're talking about HBCUs and the support. But most importantly, just your institution. It has to be full circle. It but let me. I'm gonna say around. this though. One thing I see in in American athletics in general, not just in HBCUs, but where there is winning, there are people. But people who, like, I had this conversation with uh Where Kerry there is Jackson. winning, there are people. And I'm not saying that your team should be winning for you to support them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm a believer in supporting the home team, regardless of how they're performing. Like, it's my job to support the home team. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if Southern's women's basketball team was undefeated and was knocking them down one by one, if you think that more and more people are not going to be trickling into that mini dome on a Thursday night, I I beg to disagree. Southern because won the SWAC championship last year and played in the NCAA tournament. It did not change the profile of what happens with Southern women's basketball this year compared to last year. You still had the same amount of attention. Southern played in the NCAA tournament last year. Played against Sacred Heart in the first uh, four game in. It lost against Sacred Heart, and that's my point. That, and I agree. Look, everybody, I, I agree with with like with people an like winning, and and that is my thing. And I'm not saying that you got to win. That is not the mindset that I'm saying fans should have. I'm saying having their game separate could potentially provide an opportunity. What when what's you start the opportunity when, though? When you start, well, we're gonna see if they if they if they were to start winning, <laughs> if they were to start if just, they were to start winning consistently, where there's a huge name to it, that could I could totally see that. Is it gonna be more checks written? Because I mean, we want now a that's gonna and then there's gonna also be the part that we were talking about of we want there's part that there's, and the institutions have to do in promoting and pushing the brand and making sure that we have the people in place that are gonna push the brand forward so that people have hype and hype doesn't happen overnight. Hype is, is built, especially through branding and marketing and social media. So we we will see, based on the performance, if there's going to be a push. And hopefully there would be a push to get more eyes, get more attention on it. And we, we shall see. Look, I, We look, shall see. I have to believe it to see it. And now this is the part of the show when it gets to that point of it, it's, it's, it's constructive criticism because, look, Southern won the SWAC championship last year. We beat Big Bad Jackson State, and then we went on to win the championship game against UAPB. Coming into this year, show me the hype into Southern's women's basketball to lead, to get people, more people to come to the game. Along with a head coach, a new head coach, show me the excitement that they that you saw with marketing and branding to get you to come. And, and this to anybody that's out there, show me the excitement that was created. And at the same time, I had this conversation with Kerry Jackson, who's the former baseball coach at Southern University. We, yeah, we want championships, right? But in our mind, it is the conference. It is the SWAC championship. That's about as far as we draw the line. What Dr. Travian Scott said, imagine those teams that not only just won one game, winning two, three games as a conference, the amount of money that it generates back into the conference. As much as we, yeah, we want SWAC championships and we want these types of games, when you do win it, people don't do nothing but run their mouth. That's why I asked him, you got the calls and the texts. What about the checks? That's what matters when you talk about winning championships. We'll brag all day. Yeah, we won the championship. What investment then do you give back to the program after a championship is won to then level up the program? Because guess what? When you win a championship, you're going to have to pay your coach or your coach to get out of there. 
You're going to have to upgrade your facilities. You're going to have to invest more money into the program. You want the overall profile of that program to go up. And if you don't invest that back and you just yelling, we won a championship, and then when I come back as a coach in a team next year and I'm literally in the same position, what we do at HBCUs, low-resource institutions, we say do more with less. That's the position that we're in. We got to learn how to support better as alums. We got to learn how to support better as a community. Uh, talk about real quick before we get ready to get out of here. Chancellor John Pierre, former chancellor at the Southern University Law School, now named the chancellor of the SUBR campus. Very, very exciting news. He's done a lot of work with the SU Law Center, so very exciting to see what he do. Now that does now that the president and chancellor position is separate, so President Dennis Shields can focus on the Southern University system, and Chancellor Pierre can focus on the Southern University Baton Rouge campus. Miss Brandy B. Harris, man, listen, I, I look, I'm glad you're on here now. She's the, uh, we're gonna keep this rocking and rolling, huh? Okay, we're gonna see. Yeah, we're gonna see. If I, I, as long as I get time to get my coffee on Saturday morning, we gonna, we'll make it. We're gonna and, be all right. And I like you stand your stance on something. So we need that here. We go back and forth. We have yeah. these conversations. And there's plenty more out there. I wanna thank. Spirited my, conversation. Spirited. <laughs> wanna thank my man Rob J from Jackson State coming burr, 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 burr. on. Shout out to them playing against UConn today. Tip off at 12 o'clock. One last time for the last time. Congratulations to the Gremlin State Tigers. You may never hear me say it again, but congratulations to them with the conclusion of their historic men's basketball season. And that WNIT run by their women's basketball right. team playing today. So thank you, Dr. Travian Scott for coming on, uh, Vice President of Intercollegiate Sports up there at Gremlin. That's nothing more than the AD, the athletic director. So thank him for coming on. And thank all you guys for listening. It is a blessing to have you guys tune in each and every morning on Saturdays from 7 a.m. to 9 here on Talk 107.3, as well as on our YouTube channel. We thank you guys for that. Hit the subscribe button and like. Also, share this. Put the information out there for people to be Because, look, you get, you never know what you're going to get out of us, right? And one more time, you guys. Good luck to the Jackson State women's basketball that. team. No, we gonna, they have We're going to give them some. We're going to send them some good juju, oh, like okay. I like to say, some good vibes as they take on UConn today. So, very exciting stuff for them. All right, so thank you guys for tuning in. We'll be back next week at the same time in the same place because always, it's the Jaguar Journal.
What's going on, everybody? I am Perry White. I'm the host of the Jaguar Journal. I want to make sure that you guys tune in live each and every Saturday morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on 107.3 FM. We also have our affiliates in Alexandria, Louisiana, as well as down in New Orleans. And if you're not able to catch us on Radio Live, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as follow us on Facebook. It's the Jaguar Journal.